every voice softly, softly.
this place. The train of your rope. And the train of his rope. Good evening. What an honor for me to be able to share the word with you on this Saturday evening. For us to sit together during one of the most impactful weeks ever in the history of mankind is such an honor, such a privilege. So I want to thank you for tuning in. I want to thank you for being available with your family. So I want to ask you to come and sit down and and let's hear the word of the Lord. I want to start by, by saying this week historically is huge. But at the same time, there's an there's a underlying current. And the, the underlying current is a desire, the desire of the ages for man to find hope. To find hope for his existence. To find hope for, his, for the huge question. What do I make on this? What do I do on this planet? What, what is God's plan for me? A huge question. Am I important? Does anybody care about me? Does God care about me? Another huge question. Who are you, Lord? In Exodus 34, Moses asked God, Who are you? What will I tell the people? Who are you? We've heard rumors about God. And this week clears the, the fog. It, it, it opens the curtain for us to look upon the face of the one that loved us from the beginning. I want to read you a story or tell you a story. Ernest Hemingway, many years, he's a British uh, author, wrote a story, The Capital of the World. In the story, he tells about a, a father and a teenage son. The teenage son's name is Paco. And the father and the son had some uh, issues, uh, some disagreements, and Eventually, the son couldn't handle it anymore, and he left. Teenage sons, different kind of animal. A few weeks later, the father just couldn't handle the separation, and he started looking all over. They were living in Madrid in Spain. He was looking all over the city for his son, and he couldn't find him anywhere. And he decided to place an advert in the local newspaper. And the advert read like this, Paco, meet me at the Montana Hotel at noon, Tuesday. All is forgiven. And this message is printed in the papers a week before and on Tuesday afternoon, Father makes his way to the hotel. And as he approached the hotel, uh, he could see there was, a, there was some chaos going on there. There were a lot of policemen and as he got near the hotel, he realized there was a crowd of young men in front of the hotel. And he asked the cop what's going on. And he says, sir, there are seven, 800, sorry, 800 young men here by the name of Paco. And, and they're hoping to meet their father because their father placed an advert in the paper. 
I want to share with you from a heart that this is the craving of a father for his son. But there are sons and daughters that are craving for a father. And although we hide it, we cover it with all sorts of things and issues and activities. It's there. And if the moment is right, and I trust that this weekend will be that moment for you. I'm on Saturday, so I want to share briefly with you. The question I ask on Saturday, as we look into the grave, do we find a corpse or do we find a deliverer? Saturday is Shabbat. Shabbat starts at six o'clock on the Friday evening, runs through to six o'clock on the Saturday. So Jesus had to be in the grave, uh, in the tomb, before six o'clock, before the Shabbat. So if we had to add a window and we could look inside this tomb, we would find a body lying there. But I want to remind you tonight that life consists of two worlds blending. There's a physical world, there's a spiritual world. And although we see a physical body lying, there's a spiritual thing happening. In Hebrews 4 verse 10, the author to the Hebrew writes, For anyone who enters God's rest, Stop relying on his own works. Shabbat is a day of rest. A day where God prophetically, from the beginning, wanted to make his people aware that, that there's a rest. Six days you must labor. Six days. The number of man is six. For six days man must toil and he must gather things. But the seventh day, the Shabbat, is the time for God to provide for him. And in Hebrews 4, the author writes to Jewish people, and they know this, and he says, stop relying on your own works because you can take a rest. So during the spiritual rest, something awesome is happening. Happening. 1 Peter 3, 18, Peter writes, For Christ the Messiah himself died for sins once for all, <coughs> the righteous for the unrighteous, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God. In his human body he was put to death, but he was made alive in his spirit. In this spirit he went and preached to the spirits in prison. And there's theologically a, a lot of uh, confusion about this, but let me briefly just make you aware that what is happening here is Jesus, while his body is lying, is going to preach to the spirits in prison. Now, Abraham, David, uh, Moses, these guys that died in faith, according to Hebrews chapter 11, are gathered here. And Jesus is going to this neither world or this place of spiritual awareness. And he preaches to them. And the word is kerukma, which means he announced to them. He didn't call for a new repentance. There's not a second chance. Jesus is saying to them, what I've done on the cross is enough for you. And you have more life to live. The second thing I want to share with you, Hebrews 2.14, his children share in flesh and, flesh and blood. And so he himself partook of flesh and blood. So Jesus became like us in order to make us like him. He broke the hold of Satan. The third thing I want to say to you, there's a list of accusations against you and me. And wow, how we have tried through the ages, through adherence to the law, through this, trying to live better lives, trying to do this, to get rid of this list of accusations. It's kind of, there's an awareness of my guilt and my shame and my inferiority. And Paul writes in Colossians 2.15, he says, God disarmed the principalities and powers that were ranged against us, made a bold display and a public example of them in triumphing over him, in him and in the cross. So Jesus did away. That list of accusations against you is gone. The enemy that thought that he had Jesus in captivity was mesmerized when he saw a display of power unparalleled in history. I want to say to you and close with this. There's no longer a list before God about your and my guilt. My shame, my inferiority, gone forever. 
because of Jesus Christ. On that Saturday, he took his blood. In Hebrews chapter 9, presented the blood before the throne of God and forever, forever released us from all guilt, inferiority and shame. God bless you in Jesus' name.